In the previous video, we learned about the inversion algorithm, which is a process we can use to convert, uh, compute the inverse of a non-singular matrix. And the idea was, came from the following, oh, the, the algorithm came from the following idea. If we take a matrix and we row reduce it to the identity matrix, that same sequence of elementary row operations that converts A into the identity will convert the identity into A inverse. And then how do we get that? Well, doing a row operation, elementary row operation is equivalent to multiplying by an elementary matrix on the left. So if we do uh, row operation one, two, three, all the way up to P, then we can factor the identity matrix in the following way. Times in A by E1 does the first operation. The E2 does the second operation all the way up to EP, which does the last operation. And so we have this product of elementary matrices multiplied by A is equal to the identity. Well, this tells us that the product of EP up to E1 must be the inverse matrix A. In other words, A inverse is equal to EP times EP minus one times EP minus two all the way down to E2 and E1. Well, we can turn this back into A by taking the inverse of both sides. If we take the inverse of the inverse, that is the double inverse, that gives you back the original matrix. So A inverse inverse is the matrix A. On the other hand, when you take the inverse of the right-hand side, because we have a product of matrices, the shoe sock principle comes into play. That is, you first put your socks on, then your shoes, but then you have to take your shoes off before your socks. So you're going to reverse the order of this product. So you're going to put E1 first, then E2, and at the end, you're going to get EP. But you have to take the inverses of each and every one of these things. So you take E1 inverse, E2 inverse, all the way up to EP inverse. Now these matrices E1, E2, up to EP are elementary matrices, and their inverses will likewise be elementary matrices. So this same algorithm that found the inverse of A also gives us a factorization of A as elementary matrices. And so this is the idea we're going to do. Uh, we're going to show you how to do an elementary factorization. And this is going to be based upon a previous example we did. In the, in the previous video, we did example 3, 4, 5, uh, which you can now see on the screen. Um, I'm going to have it zoomed out so we can see the entire process all at once. I do apologize if it looks a little bit small on your screen right now. Uh, remember, the matrix A was a 3 by 3 matrix. Um, its first row is 0, 1, negative 3. Its second row is 1, negative 2, 5. And its third row is negative 5, 4, and 3. Um, you can take a look at the video for which we found the inverse of that matrix, which we took by row reduce, and you can find the inverse of it down here. But we're not focused on the inverse this time. I'm focusing on the operations that got A turned into the identity. So the first thing we did was we interchanged rows 1 and 2. Then we replaced row 3 with row 3 plus 5 times row 1. We then replaced row 3 with row 3 plus 6 times row 2. We then scaled row 3 by 1 tenth followed by replacing row one with row one minus five times row three, followed by replacing row two with row two plus three times row three, and then lastly replace row one with row one plus two times row two. That was the sequence of row operations we took. Now let's take each and every one of those row operations and turn it into an elementary matrix. So the first one was interchange rows one and two. So we take the standard identity matrix and we replace or we interchange rows one and two when we get the following, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 3. That's a typical interchange matrix. Now most of the operations we did were going to be replacements. So if we wanted to replace row three with row three plus five times row one, we're going to take the identity matrix, which has ones along the diagonals, zeros everywhere else, except in the three one position, we are going to put the number five, right? So we're going to take the three, one position, third row, first column. We're going to put, instead of a zero, we're going to put a five there because we're replacing row three with row three plus five times row one. This is why I always wrote the things the way I did, row three plus five times row one, so that we get the right coordinates right here, three comma one. The, then the next operation we did is we replaced row 3 with row 3 plus 6 times row 2. So we're going to take the we're going to take the 3 2 position this time. 3 2 position and we're going to put a 6 in that spot to perform this row operation. That's the associated elementary matrix. Then the next operation we did was we scaled row 3 by 1/10th. 
So that just means we take this diagonal matrix, ones along the diagonals, except in the three position, since we're scaling row three, we're gonna put a one tenth in there. And that's how we can take care of scaling matrices. Scalings and interchains are fairly straightforward. It takes a little bit of getting used to the uh, replacement ones, but this is also something we get used to. Uh, and that's honestly most of the examples here. Then the next ones, we took row one and we replaced it with row one minus five times row three. So in the one three position, we are gonna put a negative five. So we get a negative five right here in the one three position, first row, third column. Next, we're gonna replace row two with row two plus three times row three. So this tells us in the two three position, we're going to get the number three. You just put the coefficient in there. And then the last one, we're gonna take, we're gonna replace row one with row one plus two times row two. So in the one two position, we're gonna put the number two to represent this elementary row operation. So we have these seven matrices and I claim we can factor A using the inverse of these seven matrices. So going in the same order, going in the exact same order we had from before. So the first matrix, which was an interchange matrix, we're gonna label that one first, but we have to take the inverse of the matrix. Now the good news is with interchange matrices, they're equal to their own inverses. Interchange have the property that E inverse is actually equal to E. So we don't have to make any substitution for any, any change for the interchange matrix. Then we had the, we had the uh, replacement. We replaced row three with row three plus five times row one. That's gonna come second, because that was the second operation we performed. But notice the five we had before will switch to its inverse, which is a negative five. So we, can, we make that change right there. Then the next matrix was also a replacement matrix. We replaced row three with row three plus six times row two. So we're gonna have that exact same matrix, but Instead of a plus six, we're gonna have a negative six because that's the inverse operation. Uh, the fourth operation was scaling. We scaled row three by one tenth. So that comes next in our sequence here. Uh, but instead of scaling by one tenth, this is gonna be scaling by 10. The inverse operation, we take the reciprocal, uh, the reciprocal there, which is 10. Uh, then the next one, the fifth one in our sequence was another replacement operation. That goes next in the sequence. Uh, because we subtracted five times row three from row one, the inverse operation will have a positive five in that position, followed up by the next matrix right here. Uh, this was a replacement matrix where row two was replaced by row two plus three times row three. So that plus three will turn into a negative three. And then lastly, the final replacement matrix, because we took row one plus two times row two, we'll put a negative two instead. So we took all of the inverse operations. Again, interchange matrices are their own inverses. Scaling matrices, you just take the reciprocals. And then for replacement matrices, you take the, the negative, or you just switch the sign. If it was negative, it becomes positive. If it was positive, it becomes ne negative. And this then shows how A can be written as a product of elementary matrices, which in this case, A turned out to be a product of seven elementary matrices. And I want to tell you that this factorization is not unique, that if we took a different sequence of elementary row operations to row reduce A into the identity, then we could get a different factorization. So this factorization does depend on the sequence of elementary row operations you used. And so I just want to remind us that the matrix A looked like one zero, uh, excuse me, zero, one, negative three was the first row, negative three. The second row was one, negative two, and five. And then lastly, we're gonna get negative five for the third row, four and three. And I'll leave it up to the viewer here to double check that the product of these seven matrices is in fact equal to the original matrix A, which gives us this elementary factorization of the matrix. Now in our next section, uh, we're going to talk a lot more about matrix factorizations. Factorizations of matrices are very important. And this elementary factorization is the key principle behind the LU factorization, which we'll see in that section.